Mabel was really upset by what Amy said to her. She felt like Amy was treating her unfairly. Mabel said they were babying Amy too much. She thought she wasn't chosen because they saw her as weak. Amy wasn't going to just stay quiet, though. She challenged Mabel to a sword fight to test who was stronger. During the fight, Seika noticed something sketchy. Mabel was using dark magic to help her out. She used it to block Amy's attack and even land a hit of her own. Amy was bummed that she lost. She thought using magic was cheating. Mabel argued with her, though. She said Amy's refusal to accept the truth and face reality were her weaknesses. If Amy wasn't ready to take the competition seriously, she should just quit. In the meantime, Seika had left. He was on his way to the capital city in a carriage. The girls decided to follow him there. They planned to cheer him on during the tournament. But Mabel didn't want to hang with them. She only cared about the tournament itself. She didn't want to socialize. Eventually, they all made it to the capital and checked out the tournament brackets. They noticed that if Seika won all his battles, he'd face Kyle in the semifinals. Seika thought it was weird that the Academy had picked him to fight instead of Amy. A few hours later, the tournament got underway. The rules were changed this year to allow magic. Players would be disqualified if they left the ring, got knocked out, or gave up. They had to wear special amulets designed to absorb damage and prevent serious injuries. In the first match, Seika went up against Dennis Reagan, one of the top mercenary swordsmen. Dennis was confident he could easily beat Seika, thinking mages were helpless without their protective barriers. Believing this, he charged at Seika, trying to stab him. But Seika cleverly used his talisman to teleport away and hit Dennis with a wind spell. And that wrapped up the first round. Yuki told him it was cool to have some fun, but not to go overboard. He was being too reckless. She was also worried about him using so many spirit servants at the same time. Seika said everything was good, especially now since he needed them to keep an eye on what was going on at the tournament. In the second match, this water mage went up against Kyle, a swordsman from the Merchant Guild. There wasn't much info on Kyle or his past. Just by looking at the dude, Seika could tell Kyle was keeping something on the down low. Suddenly, Kyle stopped his opponent's body, walked up slowly, and stabbed the dude with his sword. The man dropped to the ground and Kyle won the fight. Since Kyle showed zero emotion, Seika figured he was probably some experienced assassin who erased his records to stay off the radar. In Seika's past life, there were peeps who cursed others just by looking at them. They were called evil eye users. The next day, Seika had his second round fight. His opponent was this huge golem designed to be anti-magic by some woman. She told him he should just give up. Seika just sighed, summoned one of his fastest spirit servants, and totally wrecked the golem. It was so fast the announcer thought Seika used wind magic. The woman was confused. She saw his threatening face and dipped out of the fight. After that, Seika went back to the stands with the girls to watch the next fight. It was Mabel's turn against an earth mage. Here, he realized Mabel specialized in close combat, slicing her enemy's stones with her sword. The other dude tried to defend himself with stone walls, but Mabel easily wrecked them with her daggers. Seika explained she was probably using gravity magic to make her daggers way heavier than the stones. They were wondering how she could lift something so heavy and chuck it so quick. That ain't easy to pull off. In the end, Mabel sliced her opponent's staff with her sword and he gave up. The announcer shouted Mabel's victory. No one could stop the sword of the red-headed heroine. Here, Seika asked the girls why they called her a heroine. They explained that the second historical heroine was also named Mabel and used the same weapon, so it was a crazy coincidence. At night, some mysterious dude was about to send a carrier pigeon, but Seika stopped him. Seika said the other guy was a demonic spy and he needed to ask him some questions. The other guy claimed he didn't know what Seika was talking about and tried to attack him. Seika responded by trapping him with one of his vines. He knew the guy was a spy because he overheard him talking to his informant. He used one of his spirits to watch the dude. He knew the guy was sent by someone, but he didn't want to spill anything about his plans. So in that case, Seika summoned one of his more disturbing spirit servants named Satori. Satori can read minds, so he uncovered the guy's whole plan with that. Basically, that guy was sent by the demons to find the heroine Mabel. They believe Mabel is the heroine because her description matches some prophecy. They also think she took out the killer and spy they sent to the academy. Seika thanked him for spilling that info.
It was too risky to let him live, so he let Satori completely devour the dude. This scene was harsh. Even Seika felt bad for the guy. Satori knew this, because he read Seika's mind before eating the demon's informant. Seika gave Satori a stern warning, making it clear if he tried to read his mind again, he'd kill him. His words freaked out Satori, making him dip back into the portal. Seika already knew what his academy planned. It turns out they sent Mabel as a false heroine to win their tournament and attract the attention of the demons. In this way, they could protect the actual heroine, Amy. The demons didn't know that she was the real heroine, since Seika eliminated the spy and the killer who knew about it. If his presence in Mabel protected Amy, he didn't see a need to intervene. The day after the tournament, only the user of the evil eye, Kyle, a magic knight who dominated the four elements, obviously Seika and the false heroine Mabel were left. Against her, Seika would fight in the semifinals, but Mabel told him to withdraw. This tournament was not what it seemed, she couldn't afford to lose, and suggested he surrender if he didn't want to die. However, Seika denied her request. He didn't want to hand her the victory that easily, plus the audience would get angry if their fight was cancelled. Mabel didn't understand why his academy had sent him, and kept telling him to withdraw. The next battle was between Kyle and the Magical Knight. Before starting their fight, the knight cast light magic so Kyle's cursed eye wouldn't affect him, but Kyle didn't seem to care. Here, we find out Kyle used gravitational magic to protect himself from enemy spells and had perfectly mastered dark magic. He managed to immobilize the knight by joining his shadow with the enemies, and that gave him the win to reach the finals. That night, Seika was thinking about his final battles the next day. He knew after finishing he'd return to the academy. Yuki reminded him he shouldn't win the tournament to not attract attention. He had to sleep calmly, and Yuki transformed into her human form to chill with him. At that moment, Seika sensed Mabel's presence and they moved away to dodge her attack. Seika told Mabel that busting into his room wasn't a chill way to interrupt his sleep. To that, she hurled her daggers at him and shoved him out the window. Seika said he didn't want problems, why not just talk about what was going on with her? Mabel was surprised he was so kind. She revealed her plan was to injure him so he couldn't fight the next day. She had to make the tournament finals to face Kyle. Turns out the Academy sent Mabel to play the role of a fake heroine and let herself get killed on purpose by Kyle. That way the demons would think the real heroine was already dead, and they could protect Amy who was the actual heroine of the prophecy. Except Mabel had accepted the deal for another reason. Kyle was her brother, and when they were kids, their guild trained groups of four to turn them into mercenaries. They saw more potential in Kyle, so they did surgery on his brain to implant magic. In exchange, Kyle lost all humanity and became a completely different person. They ordered him to kill his other three buddies as a final exam to officially become a mercenary. Mabel managed to survive because they sold her. Now her guild wanted her dead. That's why she had to defeat Kyle. Before they did the surgery, Kyle had asked Mabel to free him if he stopped being himself. Seika had a better idea. To allow Kyle to face him instead of Mabel, since Mabel didn't need to sacrifice her life. If Kyle wanted anything, it was for his sister to finally be free. Mabel thanked Seika for his opinion, but promised him that she would fight against him with all her strength the next day. When the battle happened, Mabel fought seriously. She brought her real weapon and attacked Seika with her giant axe, which she could move nimbly thanks to her gravitational magic. But Seika realized her trick and distracted her with long-range spells. Secretly, he stuck talismans on her axe to increase its weight. And in that way, Mabel could no longer use it. Seika managed to trap her with his vines and took the victory. Mabel didn't think Seika would be able to lift her weapon, but Seika cast a spell that made it float easily. There's really no opponent that can match Seika, not even close. Seika went on to the finals and came face to face with Kyle. He told Kyle that Mabel was still alive and Kyle just said, good because I can still kill her to finish the job I was hired for. That made Seika so mad. He told Kyle to apologize to Mabel after Seika beat him. Before they fought, Seika conjured up some red smoke to block Kyle's vision and avoid that cursed eye of his. He tried hitting Kyle with basic spells, but Kyle's dark magic blocked everything. So then Seika summoned one of his monster pals, a minotaur demon so strong it knocked Kyle out in one punch. When Seika checked on Kyle, one of his curses activated. 
Turns out Kyle's clan had cursed him. Seika tried to cancel it out with his magic, but the curse kept going. Kyle knew he was a goner, so before dying, he left one last message for his sister Mabel. This really ticked off Seika. Did they really think they could take him down with curses? No way. His body hadn't disappeared yet. In his past life, Seika was the most powerful. He could still handle this. But just then, Yuki told him to chill. If he used that spell, it would get too much attention. He had promised himself to keep his powers on the down low in this life. He didn't owe Kyle anything to go to such extremes as reviving him. After Seika won the tournament, he completely obliterated Kyle's body and told everyone Kyle had just taken off. Later, Seika told Mabel what happened and passed along her brother's last words. Kyle was sorry about the four-leaf clover. Mabel broke down crying when she remembered how she had accidentally broken a clover-shaped hairpin he really liked. Later, they went back to the academy. Amy challenged Mabel to a rematch, showing her that she had mastered the same gravity magic and managed to break her sword. Mabel had joined the tournament to prove she was stronger than her bro. Since she was alone now, Amy asked her to try train together, since she'd get bored training solo. Finally, Seika confronted the academy director. It turned out they had planned all along for Seika to win the tournament and save Mabel's life. Mabel had asked them to let her join the tournament to free her brother, and the director, knowing Mabel wanted to sacrifice herself, sent Seika to defeat her before she faced Kyle. Having lived for many years, the director was aware of her strength. She devised a plan to save Mabel's life and ensure she could study quietly at her academy. From that moment, Seika became Mabel's master. After a good while, the holidays arrived. Seika was summoned to investigate a dragon in a distant kingdom. Since he had obtained good grades, his father proposed that he be sent. He told Amy he could not accompany him, as her parents were probably waiting for her at home. Mabel had to stay studying. The only person available was Aoife, so he asked her to accompany him. Just at that moment, a mysterious figure appeared in the hall. The Crown Prince of Asteria came to meet Seika and observe his magical academy. However, who caught his attention the most was Aoife. He found her tremendously attractive and proposed that she join his harem as one of his wives. Yifa, however, flatly refused, clarifying that she was Seika's slave. The tension in the atmosphere made the students stare at them, so they decided to retire to a quieter place to talk. It was there that the prince revealed more details about Seika's mission. He explained that they had lived peacefully with the dragon for over a century, and it was even said that the dragon had repelled an invading army in the past. But lately, the dragon's behavior had become erratic, attacking orchards and livestock. Although nothing serious had happened so far, the damages were increasing. Seika's mission was to find out what was happening with the dragon. Before leaving, the girls talked privately with Seika to make sure he wasn't thinking of leaving Yifa at the mercy of the prince. He must not allow her to join that man's harem. Seika promised them that he would help Yifa, but he was convinced that the prince would not give up easily. Nine days later, they finally arrived at the kingdom's capital. It was a very quiet place. The only thing causing fear was the presence of the dragon. Sometimes the dragon became considerably uncontrolled. In one of those moments, someone summoned a lava tiger to stop the dragon. But the attack failed, and the creature found itself in front of Yifa. The tiger lunged to attack her, but Seika quickly stopped it with an earth spell. He attracted the tiger's attention, but just in time, someone stopped it with a chain. The tiger's summoner appeared and withdrew it immediately. The prince, annoyed, chided this man for nearly attacking his guest, but he seemed to care little. He introduced himself as Zeke leader of a group of mercenaries the prince had hired a while back, specifically to slay the dragon. The prince concluded this was his only way to stop the dragon, planning to use the lava tiger to scare it off. However, Seika knew this would not suffice. The sizes of the tiger and dragon were vastly different. In the worst case, the dragon may abandon these lands to attack another country. Zeke interrupted boasting of having slain countless dragons and asked Seika not to interfere with his plans. Seika retorted that he should have better control over his beasts, as the previous incident had been quite dangerous. He warned not to summon his beasts near him again, or he might reduce them to cinders. The prince intervened in the argument and reminded Zeke he needed to behave with his guest. 
Seika questioned whether the queen and people agreed with killing the dragon, as it was an important symbol for their country. The prince replied he had full authority in this matter, and his people should understand, urging Seika not to get involved. Then, Yifa returned to thank Seika, but he chided her for not defending herself with magic. He warned she would not always have him to protect her, and needed to learn self-defense. He thought bringing her along had been a mistake. Yifa, crying, apologized, and Seika assured her she must do something next time. He knew he was harsh, but she had to understand the gravity so fear would not paralyze her. The next day, they went to the library to review documents about the dragon. They discovered 150 years prior, there was a similar situation. The book said the dragon was born centuries ago after the kingdom's princess incubated its egg. The dragon lived amiably with humans until another dragon, a male, arrived, and they both went to the mountains. Fifty years later, their behavior changed. They became violent, attacked livestock, and scared off approaching people, just as was happening now. This was because they had offspring and lacked food to feed them, forcing them to hunt livestock. Yifa deduced that no offspring were involved this time, as the only remaining dragon was male. Therefore, Seika planned to climb the dragon's mountain alone to discover what was happening. Seika said not to worry. He only aimed to investigate. That night, as Seika wrote in his room, someone knocked. It was Yifa, saying a maid had come, telling the prince summoned her. Seika said she needed not go, and seeing her afraid, let her spend the night there. Seika asked if she was considering the prince's harem as she settled. He said to be truthful, no need to hold back. However, Yifa misconstrued his words, thinking he was upset over earlier and wanted to get rid of her. Seika clarified he didn't consider her a nuisance, only wanted her to reconsider the prince's honor. Undoubtedly, he would miss her, but one must choose a path eventually. Yifa just said she would think about it, and they bid good night. Seika was truly hopeless at hints. He still hadn't realized Yifa wanted to be with him. Even Yuki pointed this out, lamenting his obliviousness, but Seika only saw her as a childhood friend. Later, Seika asked the prince why he summoned her at night. The prince explained he simply wanted to chat and sincerely apologized. He admitted being very drawn to Ifa's beauty and wisdom. He said he would pay any sum to add her to his harem, but Seika refused unless she changed her mind. Regarding his mission, Seika shared he planned to investigate the dragon's mountain, gone several days, so he asked the prince not to plan anything suspicious. After farewells to Yifa, Seika set off on his journey. 